science in archaeology, as you all know, is a relatively uh, recent thing. There are uh, increasing numbers of applications of network science in archaeology, but it's definitely still something that has only really taken off in the last decade or so. Now, what we want to avoid is network science becoming a, a hammer in search of a nail. We don't want network science to be one of those techniques uh, where we just want to apply it to whatever we see just because we can, and where every research question basically becomes uh, a fair use scenario for network science. We see nails everywhere if we're holding a hammer. Uh, so we have to avoid that. Uh, and I think uh, this is a common thing uh, for new uh, methods being developed or, or, or being adopted in an applied discipline like archaeology. Um, it's not, nothing special to network science at all, uh, but I think now the time is right to think critically about what can network science allow us to do as archaeologists that we couldn't do before with other techniques? Um, what kind of research context and research questions can we think of where uh, network science applications have particular potential, so enable us to do things that we couldn't do before. And can we formalize this in a little, uh, a little bit to come up with guidelines for uh, critically applied network science techniques in an appropriate way, so that the use of network science in archaeology actually contributes to a better understanding of the past and isn't just using technology for technology's sake. So, there are a number of reasons why you could potentially care as an archaeologist about network science. So, I'll try to go through these motivations why people have adopted network science and explore whether in those motivations we can see uh, maybe a unique contribution. And thinking through that unique contribution might help us to think about how we could formulate such guidelines for best practice for network science. Um, one reason is definitely that it's a bit of a hot topic. And not just in academia, but just you know, in the world in general. And I like showing this picture here, this Facebook picture. Um, I think this is probably the first network that people think of when you say uh, network science. I definitely know that I myself was very much uh, influenced uh, by things like the emergence of big online social networks like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn uh, to start exploring network science. Now that in itself might be a relatively bad motivation, but I'm not the only one at all. In a lot of disciplines, network science has emerged as a big player and a, and a very uh, common application, very often inspired by the development of the online social networks. Um, this is, by the way, I just wanted to show this slide because this hot topicness of network science driven by online social networks is not a thing of the early 2000s, it's still happening. This is uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you might recognize him, he's, he's got money. Uh, but I think in, in, in January of this year, or maybe a little bit before that, uh, Facebook redid the famous uh, Six Degrees of Separation experiment that was first performed by Stanley Milgram, and that led to the coining of the phrase that people, you know, that's six degrees of separation separate every pair of individuals on average. Uh, they redid that experiment with the Facebook network, so checking the average shortest path length uh, between every pair of profiles on Facebook, and they came up with 3.57 degrees of separation, according to the Facebook network. So that's a less uh, sexy phrasing of the, of the, of the term than 6, 3.57. Uh, but anyways, it's a hot topic, and it's still a hot topic. Also in uh, academic archaeology, this is a histogram that plots the number of publications of formal applications of network science in the archaeological discipline. And you can see it's been going on since the, uh, since the 1970s, but very, very infrequently, and really only in the last decade or so do we see a spike in the number of applications. Uh, this could, I think, also be correlated with the number of sessions that are uh, organized about uh, network applications in archaeology, the number of papers that are being presented, and also the amount of research funding that is now devoted uh, to uh, archaeological network science. So I think it's a bit of an academic hot topic as well. But just because something's a hot topic doesn't mean we should do it. That is not a motivation why network science might contribute something to archaeology that we couldn't do before. Maybe it's just a useful method. And it's useful because it allows us to do things we couldn't do before that other methods don't succeed in. So let's explore that argument. I like this list by Carl Nappert in his book in 2011, where he lists a number of advantages of network science. 
So he's thinking through, why am I interested in networks in the first place? I'll just read that out. He says, they force us to consider relations between entities, and this makes them good for thinking about assemblages and their interactions. They are inherently spatial with the flexibility to be both social and physical. Networks are a strong method for articulating scales. Networks can incorporate both people and objects, and more recent network analysis incorporates a temporal dimension that means networks can begin dynamically to unravel the complexities of how spatial patterns are generated by processes over time. Now, these are good methodological arguments for what network science allows us to do as archaeologists, which is good. This might be an okay motivation to adopt network science techniques, but this is not revealing the unique contribution that network science has to offer to our discipline. All of these things are things we could do before. There are plenty of techniques like simulation, for example, that allow us to uh, talk about dynamic processes, simulate dynamic processes. There are plenty of techniques that enable us to work on different analytical scales. Uh, the ability to switch between a spatial representation of something and an alternative representation is, can be done in any kind of uh, uh, software uh, package. So these themselves might be good motivations for thinking, I want to do network science, but they are not the right motivations for thinking this particular network science technique is the right technique for this particular job. I don't think that's captured by this list, but this is up for discussion, of course. So maybe it's just because networks is a useful metaphor. Maybe we as archaeologists very often uh, are interested in something that we conceptualize as a network. So we're interested in past phenomena like uh, connectivity or, or interaction between people in the past and we use the metaphor of networks uh, to, to, to talk about that. And then the link is easily made if we use the concepts of network science then maybe formal network techniques are the most appropriate techniques for the job. So if you are interested in studying and understanding a past social network or inter past interactions between individuals that you conceptualize as a past social network, then maybe network science is the, uh, offers the tools that enables you to better understand that. Well, not necessarily. The study of a past social network can also happen through the use of statistical methods, through simulation, through GIS, not exclusively through network science techniques. Other arguments are needed, I think. And then a final um, motivation that I commonly see is that it is uh, used as a very, um, a very useful and appropriate representation of data, either empirical data or uh, archaeologically observed data or uh, simulated data. Um, it's definitely a novel way, I mean, as far as archaeology is concerned, using a network representation of something is relatively new, and it might trigger uh, new ideas about old data. So if we uh, make a network representation, so as dots and lines of uh, an archaeological data set, this might trigger us to think about that archaeological data set in a new way and help us identify uh, new patterns. Uh, there are multiple different ways of representing network data, though, and I just show a couple of them on the left-hand side. So we've got, you know, the typical points and lines with directed or undirected edges, but that same network that you see in B there can also be represented as an edge list uh, in A, where every row represents uh, a source node and a target node, and then that same network can also be represented as a matrix in C. Uh, now, all of those are representations of network data, and it is really up to the research context to determine what is the most appropriate representation of network data. Now, just, um, just because it's a useful representation um, that enables you to maybe identify new patterns doesn't mean that this is the only uh, method or, or group of methods that will enable you to identify those patterns, that will enable you to come to those kind of conclusions. So I think if we think through those four motivations, why archaeologists have uh, been interested in network science, it seems that there is great potential for network science. It allows us to do all of these great things. So over time, archaeologists have explored the potential of archaeology and we have discovered that it is great. It is fantastic. Whereas actually, there are a lot of issues and challenges 
that we are faced with now that we are really starting to understand network science in archaeology, now that we are really uh, identifying the issues of applying it in archaeological context and wondering why am I doing it in the first place? What is this allowing me to do that I can't, uh, couldn't have done any other way? So I want to quickly go through those issues that have recently been uh, defined, and they are uh, all published in uh, a really amazing book that was published last month. Uh, by Rick Mount Scholar and Howard. It's an edited volume uh, with a lot of contributions. I'm only mentioning this because now it is actually uh, relevant. This is a book that lists uh, a number of methodological and theoretical challenges that archaeologists are faced with when trying to apply network science uh, within archaeological research contexts. Every chapter then proceeds to try to tackle uh, some of these issues. Uh, and try to formulate an answer to them. How can we overcome these issues? So if you're interested in this, uh, these issues, then please read that book. Now, I think it's useful to think about these issues um, in four different categories. We have methodological issues on the one hand, just the fact that we are dealing with formal techniques. They are, um, well, all of them can be mathematically uh, expressed. We need to understand the algorithms that underlie the buttons that we click before we click them, and the uh, uh, understanding of the algorithm, but also maybe the development of new, new algorithms, always happens in light of your theoretical understanding of your research context, and whether it's appropriate to click that button or create a new button in the first place. Um, it's not, network science is not you know, one software package or one homogenous uh, method. It is a group of techniques that have certain things in common. They enable you to uh, deal with network data. They enable you to explore the structure of network data sets, but they also enable you to simulate and represent uh, uh, social mechanisms and change of social mechanisms over time. There's a vast array of techniques that enable you to do this in very different ways, and it's constantly being expanded. Then there are um, spatial issues. So um, uh, issues of, uh, of, of spatial scales in archaeological applications, I don't know if you've noticed that, but actually most of the archaeological applications of network science have occurred on a, on a kind of um, um, a kind of macro analytical scale. So on uh, on the level of uh, interacting regions, for example, or, or sites, you know, very very large scale. Whereas actually, I can't really think of a lot of successful um, local scale, maybe intra-site interaction kind of uh, networks. So I think there's some uh, scope for more work there. Um, a third group of uh, issues is data-related issues. Uh, the fact that if we work with network science, we have to realize that categorization of our data is necessary, otherwise you cannot represent entities and relationships. Um, it also uh, reveals an issue that you have to agree that categories can be defined in the first place. Now, you know, this sounds like an obvious statement, but not all archaeologists would agree with the fact that we can conceptualize uh, uh, the past phenomena that we're interested in as bounded entities. Um, so we have to, uh, well, that, that's a challenge that's being addressed in that book. <laughs> and then, as archaeologists, maybe one unique contribution that we could make to the development of network science uh, in general is our focus on materiality, our focus on um, very often on material objects, uh, on material, um, material networks. So we are interested not only in person-person interactions, like is very often the case in sociology and social network analysis, but we're interested in object-person and object-object relationships as well. Now, there are very few to no uh, techniques that have been explicitly developed to address research, conflict, uh, research questions that concern these kind of relationships. And then there's what I call processual issues, but basically issues of uh, social mechanisms that are dynamic and that change over time or as a lot of archaeological applications deal with uh, static representations of networks and, and try to study those. This is not a problem at all, it's just there is more to network science than studying uh, static snapshots of networks in sequence. Okay, so what I hope will be clear after this session and what I hope we can reveal through discussions together is that there is more to network science than a hype that seems to have just massive inflated expectations, that there's also more to network science than just a massive pile of issues that we can never overcome. 
but that there's actually room in the future for some sort of plateau of productivity. A space we can reach where we've identified why network science is useful in archaeology. Because it can do things that no other method can. What research context uh, show particular potential for the application of uh, network science. And maybe we can come up with workflows that will enable us to do network science within those particular research contexts more efficiently. So that plateau of productivity there, I hope we can achieve that together, but we're definitely not there yet. I think one of the ways in which we can achieve that is through a community-driven development of best practice guidelines. Now, I like the format that the Archaeology Data Service has taken in Europe. So you might know the Archaeology Data Service. If you don't, Google them now. Um, they have this amazing resource called Guides to, Be Guides to Best Practice, where they deal, you see on the left-hand side of the slide here, they have um, a very large list of formal techniques, computational techniques that are very commonly used by archaeologists. And archaeologists have uh, collaboratively developed guidelines for how to critically collect, manage, analyze, represent, archive, and reuse uh, digital data that is collected or used within that particular uh, technique. So we're talking about virtual reality or GIS or computer data drawing. I think we should create one of those for network science. And what I think should be included in there is something like this. Now this is just you know preliminary, this is just a suggestion. This is the kind of stuff I actually want to discuss with you guys. The, uh, the ADS, Archaeology Data Service, Guides to Good Practice, are very often focused on technical aspects. So that's the first block of uh, things there at the top. I think it should include um, how to appropriately um, identify different uh, network data types. This can be very uh, specific, like image formats or something. How to create those uh, network data types. How we can manage network data that we have uh, created. Um, how we should document uh, that uh, network data as a data set, uh, but also how we should document uh, the studies within which we apply uh, network data so that they are reproducible. So what is the kind of information that you need to offer in order for an archaeological network study to present reproducible results? How do we then archive those things in a way that maybe in 20, 30, 100 years you can still uh, 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 redo the experiments, and how can we document network data in such a way that it can be reused? And if you reuse network data, then what are the questions you need to ask yourself in order to do that critically, in order to reuse it critically? Then I think it should be complemented by more general uh, topics, uh, such as just an introduction, including a clear formal definition of what network science is, a definition that also incorporates uh, within it, the unique contribution of network science to archaeology that clearly positions network science as something that is not just a crossover of, um, of uh, GIS and statistics or something, but that there is actually you know, something unique in that definition there. A glossary of terms I find incredibly uh, useful uh, because there's a lot of jargon, especially uh, when we're talking about network science, which is a new thing in archaeological discipline, most of the people, even at this conference, are not aware of a lot of the jargon, which is normal, right? A glossary would really go a long way to, um, to help us communicate network science application in archaeology. A list of software resources that it will enable us to uh, implement uh, network science studies in archaeology. And maybe a list of tutorials that will teach archaeologists how to use those software resources. And then a final section to conclude that is about those research contexts. I think a guide to good practice has limited value if it's purely technical. I mean, the technical side of things needs to be solid, but it's really not sufficient. I think it would be great if we could also include uh, a sort of review of how archaeologists have used network science before and what research context showed particular potential for applications of uh, network science. What were the issues and challenges, both methodological and theoretical, that other archaeologists have been faced with? And what are the challenges that are still ahead of us that we have not managed to solve yet? And maybe also, as I mentioned before, if we identify particular cases, like, for, for example, uh, something that has obvious application for network science and archaeology is the study of task road networks 
This conceptualized very, very nicely uh, in uh, network concepts and uh, network science techniques can definitely be used to say something about that. Now, can we come up with, in such a research context, with a sort of workflow for the appropriate application of network science techniques? So for the identification of specific techniques that should be used in those contexts, at the very least, in an initial phase of the analysis. I'm not saying everyone should do the same thing if you have a similar question, not at all. It's just you know, to help people on the way if you're working within a certain common research area. OK, so I want to conclude. I think we should work together towards best practice guidelines for archaeology. Uh, there's not enough time to discuss this all in depth, uh, even at this conference. But I've got a blog called archaeologicalnetworks.wordpress.com. Um, I, cur I just wrote a blog post on there, so it should be on the main page, that kind of sets out this argument. Please do have a look at that if you care at all about what I've been saying for the last 15 minutes, and engage in discussion, if not here, but preferably also here, uh, but also on the blog. Also on that blog, there's a, um, a tab called Tutorials and Resources, where I've already tried to give a lot of the things that I said we should actually create, like a glossary, for example, um, a list of tutorials, a software resource, a bibliography, reviews, all of these kind of things. And this is obviously all uh, resources that were created by a community rather than just myself. Now, so um, that was basically the conclusion. I think these arguments are also nicely set out uh, and, and a nice context is provided for these arguments by these two publications. So a special issue in the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory published last year with a lot of really good, very creative applications, like practical case studies of network science and archaeology, and then this book that was published a month ago uh, that sets out issues and challenges of formal network studies in archaeology. Uh, thank you very much. Let's discuss.